They're looking for diseases as much as they are the health of the animal. Will the animal be able to withstand the travel, whether it's in cabin or in cargo? And then apparently there's like three hours worth of paperwork for the veterinarian. Hi, I'm Kim Tolson and I'm the traveling therapist. It's my passion to teach therapists how to navigate online private practices and multiple income streams so they can travel the world. I'm a digital nomad with a virtual insurance-based private therapy practice and a multi six-figure coaching business. I'm obsessed with entrepreneurship and developing tools that can help therapists live an adventurous lifestyle. In this podcast, I will discuss my journey as a digital nomad, I'll chat with other traveling therapists, and help you navigate the complexities of running an online insurance-based practice. I'm so glad to have you with me on this journey. Managing a successful private practice can be challenging, even if you have all the skills and experience you need to support clients. Most training programs offer little to no guidance on running your own business. That's why Alma gives clinicians the tools they need to build a thriving private practice. When you join Alma, you can get credentialed with major insurance payers within 45 days, as well as guaranteed payment within two weeks of each session. You can also attract clients who are the right fit for your practice with a free profile in Alma's searchable directory. As you build your caseload, Alma also offers time-saving tools and administrative support, so you can spend less time on paperwork and more time delivering great care to your clients. Visit helloalma.com slash Kim to download your free guide to identifying and connecting with clients who are the right fit for your practice. That's hello, A-L-M-A dot com slash K-Y-M to get your guide. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Traveling Therapist Podcast. I'm really excited today to have Maggie Dickens here with us. So Maggie's a therapist, but she's also got a really cool traveling therapist story. And I actually already know Maggie. She and I got to hang out in Nashville for a conference. Ernesto Segamundo had a conference there. We got to hang out, get to know each other a lot better. We figured out that we have like similar interests, you know, in multiple income streams and all that stuff. So we've been friendly ever since. And I've just kind of been nagging her to come on this podcast because her journey is so cool. So Maggie, I'd love to just have you introduce yourself and then let's let the listeners know what your story is and what is going on with you right now, where you are and your journey and all that good stuff. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. And to be honest, I've wanted to be on the podcast, but I've wanted to wait until I was settled so that I actually had a story instead of a a story to, to happen. So we, we are in the <laughs> middle of the story now. Hi all. My name is Maggie Dickens. I'm a professional counselor licensed in Texas and I am living now in Lisbon, Portugal. So I am in a whole new continent and I have my two dogs with me and I have my full private practice that is online and has been online for a long time. And I also host the unapologetically child-free community, which is meetups in person and online membership, and then vacation packages that we have as well. Oh my gosh. I'm so excited to get into this. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember the day you told me about the child-free thing, the idea you had, the thing you wanted to do. And I was like, that is so cool. Cause I'm child-free, you know, by choice. I just never really had this strong desire to like have a ton of kids or anything like that. So I really connected with you on that too. It's like, yeah, this is awesome. Yeah. Very it's exciting. It's really interesting because the more people now that I have become expat slash immigrant, there's a Mm -hmm. conversation on, am I an immigrant or I'm an expat and I haven't decided which I use both interchangeably, but they're not actual words to interchange. They are very different, (laughs) but I've met a lot more people who are child-free by choice and Mm. child-free by circumstance and embracing that life without kids. And I, I think there's something to be said for that lifestyle for people moving abroad. Yes. It's not across the board. I do have met some families with, you know, small kids and all of that who've moved over here as well, but it's really cool. It's a lot easier to meet child-free people 
here than it was back in the States for sure. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cause you do get into, at least for me, my experience, you know, all your friends start having kids and then it's a little bit like, Ooh, okay. I don't know. I don't know anybody that could just go do something as a single person without having to worry about the kids and all of that. So it does change the order yet. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Very interesting. Yeah. So it's, It's interesting in terms of my social life over here because I am truly an introvert, not like someone who never wants to get their battery filled by people, but I am, I really enjoy my alone time. I do get my battery drained by Mm -hmm. socializing. However, when I moved here, I was like, I, I can't not meet people. So I've already started to meet people and already started to break out of my shell. And part of that is because of two things. One, because of my community that I host, I already have kind of cracked the code on how to, how to spot the people that you're going to click with, how to put in that energy, but also there's just a greater plethora of people who are at, you know, out and about Mm-hmm. in the middle of the day or out and about on a Tuesday or something like that versus those with families. It's a little different here in Portugal because everybody's enjoying life much more than the States, oh, um, nice. but, yeah. but they have their kids with them. So it's very clear that these are, these are parents. So, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So tell us, okay. Why Portugal? Why'd you choose Portugal? Oh my gosh. Do we have three hours? Okay. <laughs> I must say Lisbon was one of my favorite cities I ever went to on my travels through Spain and Portugal and everything. I loved it there. It's gorgeous. It's incredible. It's gorgeous. So the, the short answer of why Portugal is it checked off more boxes than the other countries that I was looking at. So mm-hmm. I'd gotten to a place in my life where my job was portable enough, right? Online private practice. I had the private practice long enough that Mm -hmm. I felt secure to move abroad. I've always wanted to live as an expat as early as 16 years old. So I I was in a place of wanting to do that. Mm -hmm. And I got a little nerdy with it and got my spreadsheets out and some color coding (laughs) and all of that kind of stuff. And it checked the most of the boxes. The other countries were Mexico, Honduras, Belize, Costa Rica and Panama were the mm-hmm. the five other ones. And when those didn't really work for one reason or another, I have a friend who's also a child-free person that I met online, turned into an online or real life friend who lives here part-time. And she was like, why are you not thinking about Portugal? And I was like, "Wow, time zone. I can't, I need to go South. I can't go wet or East. I can't go East. Mm-hmm. And It's a six hour time difference from Texas. And at first that seems like a huge amount of time. And then when I started looking at my schedule, it's not, it isn't that different. And so the biggest barrier to going to Europe was the time change. The other bigger barrier was the visa process is very different over in the EU versus going into Mexico, Central America, South America. But once I realized I could actually do it, the culture, the people, the weather, Uh you and I have talked about the weather. It's, it's such a temperate environment. It is, it's amazing how I'm getting hot when it's 30 degrees Celsius. So it's about 86 (laughs) Fahrenheit. It's just incredible. And there's so much to do and there's so much history. A lot of people love the food. I'm a pescatarian who doesn't like fish. So I can't, (laughs) I I can't tell you whether or not Portuguese food is great because it's all meat and fish. (laughs) But in Lisbon, they have tons of vegan restaurants, tons of vegetarian options. So yeah. Yeah. That's nice. Portugal just kind of fit. It just hit all the boxes. I love that. And I remember that about being over there too, because I'm gluten-free with celiac disease. So I remember I found a restaurant there that the whole thing, it was a tapas menu. The whole thing was gluten-free. I think we ordered every tapa in that place. That's amazing. (laughs) I wish I could remember the name of it, but it was so good. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So the food, the food's pretty good over there. Mm -hmm. And the variety. And the variety. Yes. 
Absolutely. Yes. And I, I just love a tapas restaurant, you know, and it's so authentic over there because <laughs> I like yeah. to eat, you know, I like to have lots of choices of bites of things. So yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. So, okay. So tell us, let's just go through the process. So you're licensed in Texas and you decide you're going to move over there. So what, what steps did you take to get to where you are now? Let's, it's probably long and complicated, but what was the process like for you? Long and complicated. The first was I had to verify with my licensing board that I could be out of the state. Now we, we hear it all the time. As long as your clients are in the state, then it's fine. That's not always true across the board. Mm -hmm. As a professional counselor, the rules are different than social workers, psychologists, et cetera. I wanted to be very clear of if I moved, not was on vacation or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so I consulted with the board. I also consulted with a lawyer to make sure everything was kind of good on that end, that I wasn't going to yeah. be doing something that I wasn't supposed to be doing. And then I started looking at the process for the visas. And so at the time there was only one real viable option which was mm -hmm. called the D7. So it's a passive income slash retiree visa. Okay. They also oh, had okay. had something called a golden visa, which has mm -hmm. now been discontinued. That required a significant investment in property that I was not able to do. Mm -hmm. And so some people will do the golden visa route. Now they do have a digital nomad. So a DR or a D8, I can't remember, visa that is, easier, but not as robust in, in what you get from it. So Ooh, interesting. I went with the D seven cause it was the only one that was available and appropriate for me. And yeah. what the D seven is now, here's where it gets complicated y'all. Okay. <laughs> the D Portugal is in the EU. Okay. The EU is comprised of many different countries that have decided that they want to have open borders similar to the states within the United States. You don't have to have a visa to go from Texas to Louisiana. Right. You just have to have a visa to get into the United States. Gotcha. Okay. So the EU has done this. And the difference is instead of having a very long time, they say you have to, you can only be a tourist for 90 days in a mm. rolling 120, which means you can stay for three months and then you have to leave a month and then you can come back. Okay. Is it Schengen? Is that the what they Schengen. call that? Okay. Schengen. Okay. Yeah. I've heard of that. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. And so what the visa process is in Portugal and in many places is they give you an additional 30 days. Gotcha. So you on to your Schengen visa. So okay. Hmm. This is why this is super complicated. So in theory, in that time, you have your second immigration appointment. The first one's in the States. The next one would be in Portugal. And then you get your temporary residency card and you're no longer hmm. on a visa. You are now a resident. You're a temporary resident. Many people, because of COVID, the immigration department got super backed up. And so in 2021 and 2022, some people were waiting eight months instead of within that four months to get their second immigration appointment. And so what happens is you're technically overstaying your visa. Mm -hmm. gotcha. you <laughs> so at that <laughs> point, Portugal says, as long as you have your immigration appointment, you're fine. We're not going to deport you, but you cannot leave because the Schengen will say you've overstayed your visa and wow. you're now in trouble. And so people had this, you know, they came over thinking I'm going to go travel Europe. And now they're, they're kind of stuck in Portugal for a long time. I am lucky because as of this conversation we're having, I'm three days, four days away from my immigration appointment. And that was within the 90 days. So I'm super lucky. Wow. But just to give you that little slice gives you kind of an idea of how detailed and complicated it gets. So we're not going to get too much into the further details, but that just gives you an idea of if you're going to do this, get a Trello board <laughs> and, you know, or Google sheets or whatever your, your fancy yeah. is 
post-its on the wall. I had the post-its and then our good friend Tamar Howell was like, make it a Trello board, Maggie. (laughs) Fine. (laughs) I'll do it. I'll do it. And, and then you just end up finding all of these details that, that you have to do. So things like, so for the D7 and the, the digital nomad visa is very similar. You have to make a certain amount of money Mm. per month. And it is very clear on what that amount is. What is the amount? Do you know? Is that the D7? It's not nearly as much as what a lot of people think because the Portuguese minimum wage is very low. It is a very low earning country. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think it's three times minimum wage. Okay. So I think it makes it about 20. I think you have to have like 2,500. US dollars a month or maybe, maybe that's not right. Yes. And then for the digital nomad, I think it's around 4,500 US dollars that you need to make a month and don't quote me exactly, but it's around. Yeah. yeah. Gotcha. In addition to that, for the D for the, the path I took, you had to have a one year lease Oh, or you can even apply. So that meant that this place that I'm in right now, I had to pay for for three months before I was able to move into it. Whoa. And I live in Lisbon. So the rents are not nearly, you read anything online and it talks about how inexpensive Portugal is. They're not talking about Lisbon. Okay. (laughs) Unless you're coming from like San Fran or something and everything's cheaper than San Fran. So I had to get one year lease. You have to get something called a NIF, N-I-F which is basically their uh, financial social security number. It is a number that is assigned to you and it is for your financials. You have to have that before you get a bank account, which you have to have. So you have to have a bank account here in Portugal that is a Portuguese bank. And that has to be fully funded for the at least one year of that minimum guarantee. So if it's 2,500 or 3000 US dollars, you've got to then put 12 months of that into the Portuguese bank. Whoa. Okay. So those are all these kind of pieces. And the biggest yeah. part of that is because they want to make sure that twofold one, you're making regular income. Mm-hmm. And two, you have the income in case something happens that you're not going to default on your rent. You're not going to default on your utilities, et cetera, that you have that, you have that income. Interesting. And then speaking of income, I said that this was the passive income retiree visa. I do not have passive income. I am not retired. I am in my mid thirties. And what Portugal considers to be passive is basically money that is made outside of Portugal and not with Portuguese citizens. Gotcha. Okay. So me making money from my clients in Texas, in the United States, And my business is registered in Texas. I have a lawyer who is my registered agent in Texas. So my business is still housed there. All the money I make, Portugal never sees. I could do that anywhere, right? So Portugal says that's passive. I'm not actively working in their mind in Portugal. Gotcha. Okay. But I do have permission to work on this visa, which is different. Oh, okay. In Portugal, you mean? You have permission to work in Portugal or just in general to be earning like regular income? I have permission to, to have my remote job. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Some tourist visas. So when people kind of pop around some tourist visas, you're technically allowed to be working. It's supposed to be tourist. Okay. They consider remote work to still be work. So those are all the little bits and, and bobbles of the, the details that when Cause I know Portugal comes up a lot because it's yeah. so amazing and people are really starting to talk about it. Mm-hmm. It is not the same thing as moving across the, the country. It is very different in terms of the language that they use. There's very specific definitions for freelancer versus self-employed that plays into how you pay taxes. Are you a freelancer? Are you self-employed? Wow. Not, I don't remember the difference mm-hmm. because my accountant here told me, but yeah, <laughs> it's that's why those... I rely on those people, accountants, lawyers. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So if you're wanting to move over here, even on a, a digital nomad, consult a lawyer for your current business. 
consult a CPA or whatever they're called here and all of that kind of stuff, because there's a really cool thing called the NHR. So a non-habitual resident, it is an agreement that the United States has with several different countries to not duly tax you, double tax Ooh. you. For yeah. Ooh, nice. So that's a really great thing. I have to file my taxes in Portugal and Portugal says, as long as you're paying your taxes somewhere else, we won't tax you on top of that. There are some caveats. There's some pieces to it that, you know, we're not going to get into, but overall Mm -hmm. that's the case being in my thirties. I'll be in my forties when that 10 year runs out. So then it's that conversation of, you know, what happens then? Interesting. So the accountant that you have, do you have an accountant in in the United States and over in Portugal? Like you chose to get one in both places to, to be able to figure out the nuances. Okay. And the lawyer is the lawyer well-versed in like foreign tax stuff or is that who you looked for or how do you find somebody to help? Yes. So the lawyer that I have in Texas actually lives part-time in Portugal on the same visa slash temporary residency that I have. And I found her through the online forums and she is more expensive. So when people think of registered agents, they think of Florida where it's like $20 a year or something like that for someone Mm -hmm. to just give you an address and receive your mail if you need. In Texas, it's not as common to have a registered agent because we don't have that telehealth only option. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And many of the registered agents that I reached out to would not sign a BAA. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. And so I reached out on a forum and I was like, it was Women's in Portugal forum. And I said, hey, y'all. Anybody had this circumstance come up and this woman, she was like, I'm a lawyer. I actually have my office in Texas and I live in Portugal. So wow, I was very lucky, but her services are about 10 times <laughs> what te- in Florida is oh, no. not 10 times, whatever. It's like a several hundred dollars a year, Yeah, but she, she signed the BAA and that gives me that peace of mind that if anything is mailed and she opens it and puts it in a portal, that it is confidential. That mm-hmm. is one of the things that was really big. Many of the registered agents, they just do a portal that's not secure at all. And they're reading client information. And it's just sitting in a room and I'm like, no, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not do that. Yeah. yeah. Confidentiality is a thing and <laughs> followed by that. So, um, oh she's my been gosh. so amazing. Yeah. Okay. Well, I just have so many questions just based on everything you already said. So I know so it's just so curious. complicated. I yeah, know. I know. Well, I, you guys can reach out to Maggie. I'm sure she does consultations on this now. <laughs> I don't yeah. Know. Yeah. So what is, what is an immigration appointment? Like, like, I don't hmm. even know what happens in that? So you have one in the United States and then you're going to have one coming up. So what would someone expect with that process? Yes. So there are only a few Portuguese consulates in the United States. Oh, okay. It's such a small country and the country is about the size of North Carolina, Pennsylvania. I can't something. (laughs) Yeah. Around there, (laughs) around there, smaller than Texas. (laughs) And so they don't have a consulate in every single state. And some of the consulates that they do have only work with the Portuguese citizens. They do not work with immigration. So there are uh, four, five. I can't remember. There's one in San Fran or in California. I think there's one in New York or Boston, D.C., maybe Miami. I can't remember. Mine was in DC. Okay. So I had to fly out to DC. They did have online appointments for a short period of, or for about two years during COVID. Mm. I missed that time and had to fly out to DC and I had to bring with me, I know you're listening and you can't see my hands right now. It's it's like, I don't know. What would you say that is like three inch thick? Yeah. At least eight eight and a half by 11 and three. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Of just documentation. So about three inch thick papers of documentation that wow. is everything from the application that says where I'm going to be living. It has the, it shows your financials. So this is mm-hmm. why I had a lot of mo- like a lot of paper is because I needed to show. And those of us who are 
you know, in private practice and we are not W-2 employees, it's hard to show consistent income. Mm, Right. And even if you have a robust practice, very rarely, I mean, for me, very rarely do I make the exact same amount every week, every month. Right. Totally. And even if it's give or take, let's say easy math, $500 a month, I, mean, I don't know about you, but I have slumps. Sometimes it's a summer yeah, slump. Sometimes sure. it's a holiday slump. And it's like, I made half this month because I went on vacation or they went on vacation. Exactly. Or like that, right. Yep. Yep. So showing more than, I think I showed one full year's worth of income. So since I can't show anything about my clients, I was able to show my bank statements that have the direct deposit from my credit card processor. Mm-hmm. Right. Three years of tax returns to show, hey, it all balances out. I make about the same yeah. <laughs> at the end of the day. The last three years I've made about the same mm-hmm. and showed all of my savings. I showed all of my savings and any sort of asset. So if anybody owns anything and you're keeping like a rental property or something like that, that you want to show that as well. So that made the the packet pretty thick. You show your, your lease. The lease in Portugal. The lease in Portugal, the okay. full thing, because it also has to show that the lease has been registered with the, basically the IRS over here. Wow. Um, so that it's a legitimately legitimate lease and your landlord is paying the taxes on it instead of an under the table lease. Wow. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. And then all these other little pieces, like (laughs) you have to have a money order that is specific, like a specific amount. And it's always random, like 196.32 or something ridiculous. Oh my gosh. (laughs) And because it's all about the conversions because you're paying in US dollars and it's what whatever it equals in, in Euro and the, the exchange wow. will by the hour. So, oh my gosh. Wow. That is so interesting. Mm-hmm. So, okay. So you take all this paperwork and then what is it? Do they ask you questions? Are they like, why do you want to move to Portugal? You know, do you, you know, do they ask that stuff or they just want to see the documentation to rubber stamp it? So they want to see the documentation because You're actually not, at least Portugal and several other countries do not actually, the consulate doesn't actually process it, process the the appointment, I should say. So I met at, or my appointment was at something called VFS, which is a third party intermediary. And all they're doing is making sure you have the documentation. That's it. Then they send it to the consulate down the street then the consulate will send it to Portugal at a certain point. Hmm. So if you go through this process, the one thing that I highly recommend people to do is if you're doing this DIY, which you absolutely can, Mm -hmm. I did the lawyer I'm talking about did not help me with this process at all. She just helped me as a registered agent and give me a few little bits of information. If you DIY, be assertive. Because the people at the VFS have one checklist and it is generalized. And so when they said, we don't want all of this financials from you, I said, but Portugal does <laughs> <laughs> because I am, because I had mm. also included my private practice as an S corp. So technically I do get a W2, but I get it from myself. Mm-hmm. So I had to show that I own like my secretary of state filing and getting my EIN and all of that. They didn't want any of it. Oh, interesting. Portugal does because Portugal wants to know that I'm working for myself. If I didn't work for myself, let's say, Kim, you had, you know, a group practice and I worked for you. You would have to write a letter that says you allow me to work in Portugal. Wow. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Oh my goodness. Oh, and you figured it all out by yourself. (laughs) You need to put together a a checklist or something. There is a Facebook group of like 20,000 people. And that's what they do is they help people DIY it. I also have my friend who lived here and I Mm -hmm. did a lot of research on my own of just kind of digging in. The main thing is to not be afraid of it. So many people are doing this and everything I've said right now makes it sound incredibly complicated. I'm thinking of the meme where the guy's looking confused and all the math, the equations are around his head and he's, you know, what, what 
I know that's what it sounds like. And only because I'm talking about it really quickly and I can't show you visually. Building a private practice can be challenging. I know for me, when I was starting out, I had no idea how to get referrals. I had no idea how to manage paperwork. I knew nothing about insurance billing. The whole process was really daunting. Building a private practice can be challenging to say the least. I remember when I was starting out, I had no idea how to get referrals. I had no idea how to navigate insurance. I had no idea even what paperwork was required. So growing a caseload, navigating insurance, and managing billing and paperwork all take significant amounts of time. And that's all in addition to delivering great care to your clients. That's why Alma gives clinicians the tools they need to build a thriving private practice. When you join their insurance program, you can get credentialed within 45 days and access to enhanced reimbursement rates. They also handle all the paperwork from eligibility checks to claim submissions, and they guarantee payment within two weeks of each appointment. So in addition to their insurance program, Alma also offers time-saving tools and administrative support. So you can spend less time on paperwork and more time delivering great care to your clients and the traveling world. Learn more about building a thriving private practice with Alma at helloalma.com slash Kim. That's hello, A-L-M-A dot com slash K-Y-M to get started. It's the same thing that happens when you open your private practice and it's like, what do I have to do first? Do I get a business bank account first or do I get an EIN first, right? These are all things that we figure out around, you know, along the way. And you just find a buddy, you find a friend. In this case, I had a, a friend and a Facebook group that really just kind of walks you through it. The other thing that I would say is because I'm not a nomad, because I am, I love stability and I love to be in one place and I have two dogs. Mm -hmm. So being a nomad Mm -hmm. is not super simple for me. I did a lot of research on where. Mm -hmm. So that's why it started out with those five countries, you know, Mexico, Central America, South America, and really had to get clear on what kind of life do I want to lead and what is that going to look like? And one of the biggest things I found in those other countries for me was to get the infrastructure that I needed. I sit on Zoom all day. Mm -hmm. To have Zoom working all day. Kim, you know this. Yes. (laughs) It can be very, you know, it can vary from place to place to place. And so one of the things that I kept seeing in several of those countries is to get that infrastructure, you're going to be in a very expat heavy neighborhood or city. And I really wanted the culture. If I wanted to be around a bunch of Americans, Brits, and Canadians, I would stay in the States, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know? So I really wanted to, to be able to go somewhere and have the infrastructure and the modern amenities. Like I have, uh, there's no central AC here, but there's a, an AC <laughs> unit as well as being surrounded by the porch, you know, the, the local Portuguese culture and people, it just made a lot more sense to come out here. So that helped me keep forging forward because I knew what I wanted and it wasn't a passing, you know, the, what's the word I'm looking for? Just like interest, a a whim, passing interest. like a whim yeah. or something like, Oh, Portugal sounds cool. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. It wasn't, yeah. I read an article that said you want to cut your costs in half, come to Portugal for one. That's, that's not how that works. <laughs> keep that in mind y'all. And then two, <laughs> it's, it takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of capital up front to, to make that happen. And you know, this, like putting your stuff in storage, do you do that or do you sell it and take a loss on your stuff? Do you, some people, there's a big debate of, do you ship a bunch of your stuff to Portugal? That's going to cost you anywhere between six and $20,000, or do you just buy new, you know? Yeah. All of those things are going to go into that, that decision-making process. And it's very unique to each person's situation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I wish we had thought some of that through a little bit more, like the storage unit with my bed that I thought was so amazing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> We're now paying first of it's 220 and just slowly they've increased the rate of the storage unit. And we just have, it's like, okay, now we're paying what, like 279 a month to house like a bed and a bookshelf and you know, junk really. So, you know, I wish I had rethought all that stuff, but you just don't know if you're going to like the lifestyle and it's like, you know, it's such a leap. Yeah. Yes. Oh, my bed is at my mother's house (laughs) because I loved it so much. 
the bed and the the mattress and the bed. Yeah. Because I couldn't sell it for anything that was just going to, it was going to break my heart what it was going to have to sell it for. And I was like, I mom, you can get a new bed. <laughs> she hates it. So it's in her guest room. And I'm like, oh, that's good. Yeah. Okay, fine. <laughs> but um, yeah. 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 All these little things. But like you said, I like what you said. I mean, it's with anything. It's with multiple income streams. It's with private practice. It's with doing this lifestyle, moving to another country. You just... Mm-hmm start moving forward and the pieces are going to fall into place with research and help and you'll get there. It's just, you know, if you wait until it's like all laid out perfect, it's just never going to happen. Yeah. That's yeah. what I found with everything in life, you know, it's yeah. take the leap. And, you know, one of the things that a lot of my friends said is even though, so the temporary residency, so mm-hmm. the seven is 120 days. The temporary residency is two years. You don't okay. have to be here for two years. You just have to tell Portugal, I've decided to, to leave. And you primarily oh. do that for your NHR. So it stops that tax clock. Hmm. I had to come back. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And so I don't, ha- let's say I had come over here and hated it. I don't, by the way, it's amazing. <laughs> if I had not liked it, or let's say in six months when it is winter, I'm, I've been warned about the winter. It's a oh, wet. no. It's a wet and cold, oh, rel- yeah. relatively cold, like 40 Fahrenheit that I can leave. Yes. Yeah. It will have cost me money. I sold my car. I sold almost all of my, my material goods. It's, I came over with two dogs. We should talk about that. I came over with two yeah. dogs. It would cost me a lot of money. However, we also have to recognize our own mental health and, you know, just trying to, to keep something going for the sake of going. I think some people do that when they come to Portugal is it's this idea of it's all or nothing. It's amazing. And I'm going to stay until I become a citizen, which you have the opportunity to do after five years, it takes another four to really get your passport. So Mm -hmm. it's about eight to nine years to get, to get a double pat, you know, get that dual citizenship. If you wanted it, interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, just because it's so backed up, you could forego getting a passport and being a permanent resident. There's a couple of, of reasons. Some people do that. Some of it is how long you have to be in Portugal. So once I'm in, when you're here on a residency status, whether it's permanent or temporary, you have to be in Portugal a certain amount of time. So it's either three quarters of the year or half of the year actually being here. So if I Mm -hmm. were to be a digital nomad and go to Greece and go to Germany and go to Spain and, and France, I would have to make sure that I came back regularly enough to be here more nights than not to keep my residency status. But all of those are the things that I think people really don't think about when they move to another country. This is not London. This is not Paris. This is, it is a country in the EU. There are a lot of the same infrastructure luxuries that you're used to. And then there's also not, (laughs) there's just not, (laughs) I have I'm privileged enough that I was able to find an apartment that I was able to afford that has an AC unit that has a great location close to the Metro. So I don't need to purchase a vehicle. I, and it allows for my dogs, which was really difficult. And it came primarily furnished and, you know, all of those things, but other people don't necessarily think about that or they come and they say, I don't like this couch which Ooh. my landlord doesn't listen to this. I don't like the couch. It's, it's hard as a rock. It's awful, it's <laughs> oh, awful. Gosh. but I'm not going to replace it. Right. Mm-hmm. Because of the, because of cost, I don't, I don't own this place, those kinds of things. And mm-hmm. I think people leave Portugal sometimes because they just were expecting the, the Hollywood romance. Yeah. And- right. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So interesting. Which I'm sure you see with people who start becoming digital nomads and they go, Oh, this was really hard. And you're like, of course it was. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it is hard. It's, it's great fun and, and hard. hard. <laughs> yeah. 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 So do we have time to talk about the dogs? Cause I know that oh, was like yeah. a whole thing and people always ask about like, what do I do with my pets? If I want to do something like this, so that would be super helpful if you have time to talk about it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'll do my best to give you the, the kind of the short version. One of the 
things on my list of places to move is I did not want to move to a place that required a quarantine for my animals. Right. And there are many countries and a couple of states that require a quarantine. I think Hawaii is a place where I think it's a 14-day quarantine. Okay. So there's no quarantine period. However, there's a lot of work that you have to do ahead of time to allow for the animals to be admitted into Portugal. The great Mm -hmm. thing is this is a system that has been in place and is not only for immigrants. Europeans will travel with their animals when they simply go on holiday. And so it's, there's something called an EU passport, which get my dogs after my temporary residency comes through so that you can move about the EU with the dogs, which I don't know how easily I'll do that with having two of them. So this process has been set up in place, which gives you a false sense of it's going to be oh, no. <laughs> and well run. And it's not because it's bureaucracy <laughs> right? and, and two governments <laughs> and all of that kind of stuff. So the, oh, the long and short of it is that you have to have your dogs undergo a full physical, if you will. Okay. by a USDA certified veterinarian. Not all veterinarians go that extra route. And I talked to veterinarians and asked them about it. And they said, because it's, it's like us picking up a specialty. It's more training. It's more money. It's more hassle. And yeah. so it's kind of that cost benefit analysis for them on, on what they want to do. Mm-hmm. And it's a full physical. It's not a lot on the dogs. It's not much more than their annual. They do kind of poke and prod at joints and, and those kinds of things a little bit more. They're looking for diseases as much as they are the health of the animal. Will the animal be able to withstand the travel, whether it's in cabin or in cargo? And then apparently there's like three hours worth of paperwork for the veterinarian. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And so there's a significant cost to that. You can look at anywhere between about 500 US dollars to about 1500 US dollars, depending Mm -hmm. on your veterinarian, how many animals you have, what kind of animals you have, et cetera. And part of that process is the EU requires that every dog is microchipped. And not only are they microchipped, they have to be microchipped by an international microchip. It's wow. Like 15 characters. Apparently there's one that has less. Oh, wow. So you end, here's where the complication gets. You have to have the, the microchip implanted before the rabies shot. Oh my gosh. You have, have, you have to have that documented that this dog with this microchip is in my office, right? And then they have the rabies shot wow. and it has to be, even if you're at a three-year rabies shot and you just got it last year, you have to get it again. It has oh to my be gosh. My time. Yes. It's yearly. And then, wow. and so there's kind of some pieces there. And then you have to have the physical within 30 days of arrival into the country. Mm. You cannot submit the paperwork more than 10 days prior to arrival. Oh my gosh. Wow. And the USDA promises the largest air quotes you could ever imagine right now. If you guys could see Maggie's face, she's like, they promise. <laughs> promise that they will get you your certificate, your USDA certificate to enter Portugal within about 72 hours of your flight. Now, now if that had worked, that would have been amazing and still (laughs) stressful because you're three days from flying your entire life over to another country. And for some people, they, they make a trip of it. So to save Mm. money or to make it easier on their animals, they'll drive from the West coast or the middle of the country to the East coast before they fly. So think about those kinds of things. I was on the, I was on the East coast already. I had Mm -hmm. finished my lease in Texas. I was hanging out with my mom for two months, bless that woman. (laughs) And so I was a little bit, I I didn't need to do that extra travel. My story. Oh, so, oh, I think I have like a little bit of, no, I can see it. (laughs) My story was, so I was flying out on a Saturday. You have to prepay a FedEx label to do overnight shipping and include Saturday delivery just in case. Remember, right? Because 72 hours, they'll get it to you three days before Mm -hmm. you fly. No problem. Yeah. It was 
Friday. I fly out on Saturday. It is Friday morning. And I have called the veterinarian and they say it's still processing in the system. Oh my gosh. Remember, I still need it to be blown to me by FedEx. Yes. I have to be at the airport at 11 in the morning. Oh my That's not my gosh. departure, but that's when I need to be at the airport checking in. It took mm-hmm. about an hour and a half to check in because of your bags and the dogs and all of that. So it was still processing. And I Ooh. was so up in arms. And I was like, I don't know what to do. And I was looking at the FedEx label and my veterinarian made a mistake and did not do Saturday delivery. And I was like, okay, well, that's not great. What am I going to do? So I send an email and I'm like, here's a Hail Mary. Like I'm going to send an email to a government agency on a Friday and hope this works. And they called me around 3 p.m. And they said, we got your, your email. We're going to process your information right now. You don't have the right label. And I said, get it. You need to talk to your veterinarian. And I said, do I have to, can I just send it to you? Cause this was a, a new to me veterinarian because I had already left Texas. If you're in the Houston area and you ever want to do this, I have a veterinarian who I love (laughs) your information, but this is not the veterinarian I'm talking about. This is just a random person that I Found. found. Yeah. And they said, yeah, absolutely. And it made a whole lot more sense because my original label was like $30. And then this label was like 200. Oh, of course. (laughs) I was like, well, that, okay. Overnight shipping. Like that makes a lot more sense that it wasn't $30. Right. Wow. And I had a friend flying in from the middle of the country to Raleigh, Durham to fly with me to, to Portugal for a couple of reasons. I would need an emotional support human to help me yeah. this situation. I also needed, my dogs are small. They're five and 10 kilos. So 10 and 20 pounds. Mm. So one of them in cabin with me and it's one dog per person. Oh gosh. So I needed gotcha. someone to come with me. Oh. And so we put her, we put her hotel's address and her name on oh the shipping because my mom lives an hour and a half from the airport. Oh my gosh. Are you serious? Yeah. So the way that we figured it out was we had, but we weren't sure if, if they were still going to send it to that address or the address on the form. Mm, And so we weren't sure. And neither was the USDA. And I was like, how do you not? Oh, cool. Great. (laughs) So because I had so many bags, my nephew drove one car. My mom drove one car and it's packed with bags and me and my dogs. And my nephew took, took us up, took me, my nephew, and my mom, we went up to the airport. My nephew was going to drive straight back to my mom's house. Oh my God. If it was going back there, right. Cause we were doing the, the tracking information. If it was going to go back there, he was going to haul his self <laughs> back there to get it and then bring it back to me. Luckily it got to my friend's apartment or uh, my friend's hotel at nine 30 in the morning. Oh my gosh. Are you serious? Wow. Yeah. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Just in the nick of time. Just in the nick of time. Oh my gosh. And we were like over the moon, everything's fine. You know, I'm just like (laughs) cortisol dump, right. Just like absolute drained at that point. And we're just starting the journey. We wow. get to Lisbon and you have to check in with a veterinarian on staff in the airport before you even leave. And the veterinarian there does another wellness check of your dog and verifies that the dog or cat or whatever yeah, is the dog or cat that you said you were bringing in. So they check for the microchip and oh they check gosh. all the information to make sure that you didn't like swap the animal or something like that. One of my dogs has two microchips. Oh no. Mm-hmm. One, oh, of, my gosh. one of them is because they're both rescue dogs. And so one of them has two, I guess, from two different rescue people. I don't know. Yeah. And she could only find the one that was technically not the the international one that is has the 15 digits on every piece of paper. 
Yeah. She, oh my gosh. She find that one. She found the other one and she's oh. like, I don't know what to do. And so I had to find in, in my like back, back register of information, her adoption records from oh 2013 that I still had y'all paperwork, paperwork, oh. paperwork, save it, oh save it. And showed that she was adopted with this. Uh, oh my goodness. So they were like, okay, I guess it's the same dog. They let you go. Well, then she said, I need it to say both numbers. And so I had to contact the veterinarian, but I contacted my old veterinarian Mm -hmm. and I said, Hey, do you have anything, (laughs) do you have anything that you can send them? And they were able to give me what I needed. So, Oh my gosh, that is unbelievable. Yeah. That was about a three hour process. Oh my gosh. After what? An eight hour flight or how many hours is that flight over there? Oh yeah. Yeah. It was oh a my gosh. Good 13 hours of travel, Raleigh, oh my gosh. Raleigh to New York, New York to. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. my goodness. I know. Yeah. So you got to really want to do this. <laughs> you do. And then when you get here, it's just, it's, it's like, amazing. Yay. It is, it is such an amazing place to be. And oh my gosh. I That's have friends awesome. who are already wanting to visit and. Oh yeah. Um, I'm already thinking like, okay, I need to go back to Portugal and see Maggie. <laughs> and you know, it's amazing because having my private practice has not been as difficult over here as I was expecting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because the six hour time difference really meant that I was just moving my clients from seeing me, you know, 12 to 6 PM Houston time. We're now 6 AM to 12. Mm-hmm. No one's really grabbed that 6 a.m. spot, but I'm hoping <laughs> one, day, one day, but I do have a couple that I see at 5 p.m. Houston time, which is 11 p.m. my time, but this is oh, a, wow. a late night place and mm-hmm. at 11 p.m. people are still finishing up dinner. Yeah. So, I remember that when I was there, it was like, even, even it gets dark much later, at least when I was there, I don't know. I'm sure mm-hmm. it's different for different seasons or whatever, but yeah, I remember that everybody was like, I'm like, where are these people going? They're like headed to dinner. It's like 10 30 at night. Yep. Right. Yep. So it doesn't, it doesn't mess with my schedule too much to have mm-hmm. the twice a week. I have an 11 PM and, mm-hmm. and so it's been amazing and they have I've only had issues with the internet twice. One time it was my fault because I ripped the wire out of the wall. <laughs> Don't do that. And then Oops. the other, it, was, it wasn't it was a problem. And I have a backup hotspot and, well, I have two. I have two backup hotspots. I have my Portuguese phone that I can hotspot. And then I have right. my US phone. So That is awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I'd love if you just tell everybody about your, your membership, your community, and also, you know, anything else that you want to share that they can get in contact with you or how would they reach you? I love your Instagram because you're always like doing little Portuguese updates and stuff and kind of showing around <laughs> the town and stuff. So, so mention that too, please. <laughs> I do my, I do my best. Instagram yeah. is kind of where you're going to find me. I know a lot of therapists hang out on the book of faces, but I'm over on Instagram and you can find me at child free underscore communities. It used to be something else, but I changed it for threads, which I was oh, on yeah. for three days before they kicked me out. Cause it's not allowed in the EU. Really? Oh, interesting. Yeah. I think I heard that, that people couldn't access it. Oh, there's the meta isn't complying with a lot of the, I will have to call that person back. Yes. Meta does not comply with a lot of the EU privacy rules and things like that. So I was on threads for like three days and now I'm kicked out. So you can find me on Instagram and I talk all things Portugal. And then I talk about how to build and maintain friendships with other child-free people. I find that there are so many spaces for other small niche communities, and there's not many for the child-free. And while it is really awesome to have my friends who have kids, it's also really necessary and vital that we have friends who get us and understand Mm -hmm. our lifestyle and come from a place of of true understanding in that respect. So you'll get all of that content. It's a lot of dogs. I'm just going to say it's a <laughs> lot of dog content. I'm a true yeah. millennial dog mom. That's just how it is. But I am your kind of child-free bestie. And I've been building online communities for building friend friendships, making them 
transcend the comment section into mm-hmm. in real life, ride or die friends, you know, similar to, I think you've done this in the therapy space, meeting people online. And then eventually there are people who you go and visit and you talk to yeah. every day. And there's a little bit of, I think there's a method to that. I don't think it's just happens. So that's what I'm here for is to help people kind of guide them through that process in a non-educational way, more of just a, mm-hmm. I'm your peer and helping you through it. So we have international meetups that are free and they just pop up throughout the world. If you want to host one and let me know because I can't be everywhere at every moment. We have yeah. our online membership. That's a monthly membership. We have a WhatsApp group that is super active and we also meet twice a month on Zoom. But the coolest thing, if I've scared you off of Portugal, let me bring you back because um, are having a one week, so six, six nights, seven days in October. So October 1st through 7th, it's going to be a small group, about eight child-free people who are wanting to not only have an amazing adventure in Portugal, because like I said, it's, it's incredible to be here. It's kind of difficult to move over, but it's incredible to be here. Yeah. You heard Kim talk about, it was one of her favorites to go to, and it's also small enough and tailored enough that the friendships that you make they're going to have the potential to last longer than that one, that one week. We've mm-hmm. all met that person on a cruise or at an all-inclusive and we should stay in touch and you never yeah. do. And so not only when you go on the getaway, you will also have one year of a subscription to my monthly membership. So oh, you can nice. connect with each other for that year afterward. And wow. so it's, it's kind of this whole wraparound thing that says we deserve to have some, you know, bomb friendships that really are deep and are vulnerable and open and silly and ridiculous and all of those <laughs> things. And unapologetically child-free communities are the place to do it. Oh, I love that so much. Yeah. So the, the October trip is still open if people want to join. Yes. I just nice. opened registration a little while ago and then I stopped talking okay. about it because I was getting ready for my immigration appointment myself. And then I think I was mentioning to you, anyone who wants to join and joins through Kim and and this podcast, I'm going to give her a coupon code for $200 off. And so that if you're thinking about it, there's only, I think five or six spots left. So there's not a lot. So grab it while you can. (laughs) I love that. Yeah. We'll put it in the show notes for you guys to connect with Maggie and probably, I guess there's a way for them to get on your email list. If you're going to have more trips like that in the future, that sort of thing. Uh, Great. We'll add all that for you guys. Thank you, Maggie. This is so informative. I feel like I could like have five more episodes just about this topic, but (laughs) you know, if people have questions, like you said, they can reach out to me or I'm happy to, you know, come back on and be a little bit more clear about things. I'm, I'm not going anywhere now. Yeah. I definitely (laughs) want to have you in the traveling therapist membership because they're already asking for like a whole month focused around international moving. Like, how do you manage that? So I, you know, I'll talk to you about it more, but I'd love to have you in there just the, like a Q and a, you know, to really help people that want to move to Portugal or that area, you know, I think it'd be super helpful. So. Absolutely. Yeah. That'd be great. And Thank you. you know, yeah, you're welcome. And one of the things that people talk about it. I'm a super connector. And that's why I have these communities is because I'm always thinking, Oh, you should meet so-and-so I already have. I'm going to, talk with you after this. I have two child-free people who are, one has already moved to France and another is in the process of moving to Spain. So child-free therapist. Yeah. I will connect y'all. I love that. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. And I've just really enjoyed talking to you and you guys reach out to Maggie if you have more questions. Thank you so much for listening to the Traveling Therapist podcast. For show notes, links, and downloads, head over to thetravelingtherapist.com, where you'll be able to learn more about my journey, the courses I've created for you, and other exciting resources to make your dreams become a reality. If you've enjoyed this episode, please share with your traveling therapist friends, subscribe to the podcast, and if you love this episode, please leave a review.